morning. I, we um, do ask if you have not already done so, if you could please mute your microphone, this will help us keep background noise to a minimum during today's presentation. Um, so make sure that if you're not speaking that you are muting your microphone. Um, if you have any questions that come up during the presentation or at the end, please do use the chat feature to send those questions. You can send them in to everyone. You can send them to me as the moderator. Um, we will be, our presenters will be allowing questions during their presentation, but if we want to save those for the end, there'll be a few moments to share those questions at the end as well. Um, and I wanna introduce you to our lead presenter. Uh, Lynn Kirkendall is an early learning specialist with the Office of Early Learning and Literacy with the South Carolina Department of Education. In her role with the Office of Early Learning and Literacy, she supports and collaborates with SIRDEP districts, schools, and teachers to strengthen early learning environments, which support teaching the whole child, as well as provides training to ensure implementation of best early childhood practices. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Lynn. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and I would like to welcome you to Interactions Matter, how to connect with young children to extend their learning. And I'd like to introduce my coworker and partner, Angela Compton. Angela is an early learning specialist with the Department of Ed in South Carolina. She is passionate about her role in educating the whole child while supporting and collaborating with SIRDEP districts, schools, and teachers to inspire and empower through supportive coaching, training, and feedback in the implementation of best practices. So welcome to our session, and we're going to get started. Um, Angela, you can go to the next screen if you don't mind. And I just would like to share with you, our team has grown at the, uh, in the Office of Early Learning and Literacy. I'm not going to read these names to you, but know that our team has grown from three CERDAP monitors, four early learning specialists, and six, seven family engagement folks and coaches around our state. So we are here to support schools, districts, parents, teachers, whomever might need the support. So we're going to begin quickly. And I just want to take a few moments to talk about the foundations of early learning in South Carolina, the two documents that we build our early learning practices on. We know that in South Carolina, children are deemed ready for kindergarten when they are five years old by September 1st of the school year. But we also know that kindergarten readiness is much more, much, uh, much more than a matter of age. For a strong start in school, our children need positive relationships and supportive learning environments, which begin at birth. And as families, caregivers, and communities, it is our responsibility to nurture the health and development necessary for school success. So our profile of the Ready Kindergartner describes the physical, the cognitive, social, and emotional signs of school readiness. And because each child develops at a different rate, each child will be different be ready in different ways. That is why schools, educators, and families must be ready. We have to be ready to be, meet the individual needs of students at all levels of readiness and provide support and services whenever they're needing. The other document is the South Carolina Early Learning Standards. And in 2013, the South Carolina State Child Care Administrator's Office and the Division of Early Care and Education within the South Carolina Department of Social Services reauthorized uh, and funded the revision of the gross, Good Start, Grow Smart Early Learning Standards. And we created the South Carolina Early Learning Standards. And this document, <coughs> serves as the shared vision of what we want our state's children and it answers the question 
what foundational skills do children need to experience in school for success. So by providing this common set of goals and developmental indicators for children from birth through kindergarten entry, our hope is that family members, educators, administrators, and policymakers together can do the best job possible to provide those experiences to prepare our students for success in school and in life. So Angela, you can get to the next slide. Education leaders know that a small number of academic and personal interpersonal qualities and capabilities are key to helping students be successful. So as we look at these five C's, as I like to call them, I want you to think, how do these skills relate to the profile of the South Carolina graduate? We're talking collaboration, creative innovation, communication, critical thinking, and content. Next slide, Angela. Now, I want you to look at the profile of the South Carolina graduate. Do you see some of those same skills here? Look at the world-class skills and the world-class knowledge. All of those things are included. Next slide. Angela. Effective engaging interactions serve as the foundation for learning in early childhood classrooms. So we're going to take a few moments to look at the why. Why is that? Why is effective communication a foundation for early learning? Next slide. The research has been done and it is very clear. Hart and Risley in 1990s estimated that by age three, there was a 30 million word gap between low income and professional families. Think about 30 million word gap. NAEYC shares evidence of vocabulary gaps by 18 months old that increase larger by the age of two. And then another near replication of the Hart Risley study calculated that the language gap is more like 4 million words with some variability. It said that these gaps cannot predict language gaps because we have to account for words spoken by caregivers to the child, as well as the ambience words in their environment. But regardless, 4 million words is significant. Recent publications critiqued the model of deficit thinking characterized by the use of the term gaps. Instead, they like to switch to the word, word wealth. Think of building a foundation and serving students versus fixing them. So I love word wealth. This is to say that kids don't come to us with the same experiences and we have to support language development in their classroom. More excitingly to me is our work makes a huge difference in building this foundation. Additional research, as you'll see on the screen, highlights how important a rich language environment is to early learning success. I'll just give you a moment to read those bullets. Now I'm going to ask Angela to take you through an activity that we would like for you to participate in. And while she's doing that, I am going to um, work on breakout rooms for you. So 
when we think about what Lynn just talked about and all the research about how our interactions matter and how our conversations matter. So we're gonna talk. You are going to be placed in a breakout room and you are going to have three people in your breakout room. One person will ask one of the questions that you'll see in just a few moments. One person will answer <coughs> the question and one person will count the number of words spoken by both. So let's talk. You're going to only choose one of these questions if you, the, if you are the person asking the question. So what commercial bugs you the most? If you could be any bug, what would it be? What's the weirdest thing in your backpack or purse right now? Not sure I would want to answer that one. What's the, just kidding. What's the most expensive mistake you've ever made? Which movie makes you laugh every time you watch it? And which name would you choose if you had to rename yourself? And if you could choose, if you could have any extinct animal as a pet, which would you choose? So Lynn is going to send us to breakout groups. You um, have jobs. If you should have more than three in your group, maybe two people can count the number of words. Um, one could count the number of words spoken by the person asking the question and one could count the number of words spoken by the person answering the question. So one to ask, one to answer, and one or two to count the number of words spoken by each, both, both parties. And I would like to say, you may want to choose a question in case your group chooses you to ask a question. Yes. So before you go to your breakout room, choose one of your favorite questions in case you're the one that's going to ask a question. I will let you decide in your breakout room what role you'll take. You should be sent into your breakout rooms and we'll call you back in three minutes.
Angela, they're coming back. Okay, thank you, Lynn. It will take them a moment to get here, about 30 more seconds. Okay. Are we ready, Lynn? I think we are. Okay. I would love for someone to, um, if you were the person that counted the number of, word, of words spoken, um, I would love for you to unmute and share. How many words were spoken by both parties? 28. <gasps> 28. That's really good. That is really good. We had 42. Oh, oh better. Wow. wow. It was around 30 for us. Wow. Wonderful. That is awesome. So when we think about what you guys just did, and we think about interactions matter, what is serve and return? And you guys obviously did a wonderful job with that. But when we think about our interactions with young children, our brains are wired for interaction and we thrive and that is how our brains grow. So serve and return is about responsive um, interactions. And we have to plan these interactions um, and we have to be intentional with these interactions as we're going to see as we move forward today. So here's a little bit of research on serve and return. I am not going to read these to you um, verbatim. If you will take just a moment to skim and scan a little bit deeper into what do we, when, when we hear those words serve and return, what does that really mean? conversation you know back and forth conversation absolutely thank you for sharing um and and that is critical and i think there's a lot of research here that says look at what happens it is crucial for the development of a child's brain architecture uh, even young infants interacting when parents um get on their cell phones and you can see the infant start to to cry or because the parent is not giving them that attention and that providing that safe relationship that they need. So I think again, when we think about, you said it, those back and forth conversations, that continuous give and take, serve and return. And I love this last part. We have to think about experiences that are individualized. So you said it, um, our conversations, um, when two or more people talk, it helps us build connections. It helps us learn about children's interests. And it does encourage all of those, the whole, when we think about the whole child, cognitive, social, and emotional um, maturity, as I know all of you already know. 
I can't get it to go to the next slide. There we go. Angela, yes. it skipped a slide. I oh, know, I'm sorry. <coughs> okay, so we cannot see that. Um, we have an example of a thick, thin conversation, and I know you can't see it. So we're going to, Lynn, you and I are going to have um, an example of a thin conversation. Um, and then we have an example of a thick conversation. So when we think about the research that Lynn just shared with us and the research on serve and return, having thick versus thin conversations is going to be important. So I want you to think about the conversation. So Lynn, the thin conversation, what did you make? An airplane. Does it fly? Yes. So when we hear that conversation, um, just for time's sake this morning, those are closed questions. Lynn could have even shrugged on the last one. Does it fly? She could have shrugged her shoulders, but it was one word answers. So if we look a little bit at the thick conversation here and we'll go very quickly, but what was your favorite part of creating this piece of art? I liked making the airplane. Oh, you made an airplane? Tell me how you made that airplane. Well, I drew on the paper and I folded it up. <clears throat> oh, I see, Lynn. You drew your design on the paper with markers and then you folded the paper into an airplane. What is your next plan going to be? Well, I'm going to fly my airplane. <gasps> and then we say, oh, how do you know your airplane will fly? Um, the teacher brings in the word hypothesis. That's a great... And, you know, the child might say, well, we're going to fly it and see. And that's a great way to test. We bring in those vocabulary words. I love the two yellow circles that you see here. So let's look quickly at the thin conversation versus the thick conversation. It's like a mic drop. The child hears 113 words. He speaks 44 and he or she has six opportunities to practice language skills. So when we think about working with our families and our educators, we have to be cognizant. Are we having thick conversations with children? And maybe are we having more thick conversations than thin conversations with children? So you're going to get to go talk some more. Let's talk some more. You're going to think about that question that you asked. Previously, if you asked the question about the animal or you asked a question about what was in your purse, um, you're going to use your conversation starter from the previous activity and you're going to extend the conversation. So I'm going to pop these questions back up very quickly. And um, what I would like for you to do now, keep those same roles. And I want you to extend the conversation. So Same that, means, that means two way. So we've given you your first question, but what are some other questions you can ask to keep the conversation going? <clears throat> so Lynn, I guess you're going to send us back to breakout groups. I'm opening those rooms as we speak. And so um, you'll have three minutes. Mm 
when yes i think when i hid those controls it wouldn't let me like advance to the next screen mm -hmm. Are they coming back, Lynn? Not yet. Okay. They have about one minute. They should all be closed in less than 30 seconds, Angela. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back. I hope everyone is back. Would love for you to share your thoughts. What was the difference this time? Would someone love to unmute and share out? What was the difference? Well, we went into a little more detail about the if, ands, and buts about the situation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we use the question, uh, what commercial bugs you? And so we talked about uh, our commercial, which was Hawk Law Firm. Hawk Law. Hawk Law. <laughs> yes. That would be mine too. Now I'm going to have that in my head all day. I'm just kidding. Um, so, and how many words did you guys have the second time? Uh, probably more than 100. Oh, and so you've... you've probably more than doubled yes. the number of words. So yes. do you feel as though you know the person better? Well, I do, because we, we discuss some common things. <laughs> and so so we do. Uh, she considered herself to be not an introvert, and I'm not an introvert. We consider ourselves to be people that don't meet strangers. We can talk regardless. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so through those comp those interactions and those thicker conversations you guys um got to know each other better yes you quadruple the number of words heard and spoken yes absolutely would anyone else like to share very similar to us, I think we had um, a thicker conversation for sure. Um, we gave each other the opportunity to answer the same question that we had the first time. Our question was, um, which movie makes you laugh? 
And so um, my co-partner, she shared Home Alone and The Grinch. So it was a tie between those two. And so we extended the conversation by then starting talking about the holiday season and what we enjoy about the holiday season. So very fun. So it took you in a new direction. Yeah. (laughs) Good job. Yes. And I heard somebody else trying to, 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 don't want to leave anybody out. This is Rose Brooks, and then our group, we, our conversation was extended as well, but we talked about the commercials and the weirdest thing that was in your purse, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, and Miss Nelson is it or was it Miss Barnett? Uh, talked about her receipts in her purse, <laughs> and I, I talked about the commercials. My, the commercial that bugs me the most is Shelly Lee, the lawyer. It's on every time the TV comes on. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, goodness. So did you guys, what about words, number of words? I think we had probably, because our session seemed to be kind of short, but I'm pretty sure we had probably close to about 100. Wow. Wow. So I think we can think about, Lynn brought some good points. When we think about these conversations, are we as educators or as parents and how do we help our parents especially see the value in these conversations for some of you it took you in a totally different direction for most of you it took you into a deeper conversation around with more details and you were also were able to get to know that person a little bit better. Lynn is gonna now take us through what does it look like to embed brief language interactions throughout our- I'm sorry. So when we think about conversation and our experiences that children have and the discussions that we facilitate about books read to children and other conversations, We want to think about making certain that they're embedded throughout the day. They're brief, but not so brief that they become thin conversations only. They're frequent. They can be used one-on-one with a child or with larger groups. And there needs to be opportunities to provide feedback to children. So we want to keep it a two-way conversation, a multi-turn conversation. So there's some strategic scaffolding that needs to happen and occur during conversations because we have to provide an intentional response for children. We have to know that their current language skills can match the scaffold that we need to provide. So some examples of scaffolding for children, maybe we restate what the child uttered, or we elaborate and expand on what they say. We can model using words to describe their actions. And of course, we know that we can ask open-ended questions to maintain those conversations and ask thought provoking questions that encourage the children to think and verbalize solutions to problems. So those are key scaffolds that we could keep in mind as we're having these conversations with children. Now, I want us to take a few moments to watch a video. And in this video, I want you to pay particular attention to what the conversation is about, how the teacher may or may not be scaffolding children in the conversation. So um, Angela's going to play the video and we're just going to watch. I'm a teacher just like you. It's, it's not actually showing the video. We no. need to change the screen share setting. We might need to Looks like it's blocked out. Okay, hold on. And Angela, I don't know if maybe you could share the link to the video maybe in the chat. We could probably just individually watch it that way. Okay. Are y'all seeing it now? Yeah. How about now? 
No. We're only seeing a blank screen, Angela. Lynn, do you have the link you can? Um... I don't, but I can go find it. Hold on. Now are y'all seeing it? Yes. Yes. Making a turkey? You're just getting a new pencil. What's wrong with your pencil? What's wrong with it? What's wrong with your pencil? You're gonna get a new one? It needs to be sharpened, you're right. It is not it is dull. Who fixed your hair like that? I mean, my brush. Oh, you used a brush to fix it? Oh, it's very pretty. And I like it. Who fixed it? And then she brushed your hair. Daddy brushed your hair. No. You didn't brush your hair. Your mommy brushed your hair. That's cool. I like your hair. Oh, it looks so curly at the bottom. Okay, we're gonna try to paint. And you can play on the slide. Yeah, what are you going to do on that slide? Um, we are going to slide down on the slide. Slide down on the slide with your what? Feet. Feet first, right? And then, they go feet. Feet. And then, and then up the stairs and down the slide. Up the stairs and down the slide. But not up the, up the slide and down the stairs, right? That would be backwards. Okay. <laughs> right, that's true. You can go and sit on the slide and go down the slide and go wee, and then you can run around the stairs and go back up the slide and sit on the slide and go wee. You can do it all day long if you want to. Katie, can you throw it that high? Whoa, Katie, that's super high. Whoa, Katie, that's super high. Let me see it again. Okay, let me see. I want to see something really cool. Oh, that is super cool. So did you know what they were? Yeah. It was on the box. It was on the box. Did you know that they would stick together with magnets? What do magnets stick to? Metal. Metal. We found that out the other day. But how did it stick to our wall then the other day? Because our wall is not metal. Remember when that happened? Oh, Sean, you are so right. Sean said inside it is metal. Remember we thought maybe we thought maybe there was some metal inside the wall. Because... We'll stop right there, Angela. So what did you notice about the conversations or the lack of? Anyone want to unmute and share? She did a good job of scaffolding children, I think. Um, I think that she could have asked some more thought provoking. She had a few questions in there that were thought provoking, but she was serve and return. She was displaying that. Any other questions? Well, I'm going to turn it over to Angela because we have um, about five more minutes before we want to get to our question time and we're going to finish up. So um, I want you to think about, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here, Lynn's talked to you about the brief frequent interactions throughout the day, but ensuring that they are multi-turn conversations. So again, it does involve, as you've already said, someone shared, it is that back and forth. 
where you build on, you connect with the child. And going back to that original slide for Lynn, I really want you to think about your conversations. You know, how many of you maybe restated what your partner said, or maybe you expanded on the ideas by elaborating more on what your partner said. And in this case, it would be the child. Um, how many of you asked open-ended questions during your conversation the second time when you got to extend it? So thinking through all of those things, and we do have to be intentional about that. And I like the fact that it is most productive, as you see here, one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. And as Lynn has so eloquently said throughout today, each child that you, if it's a small group situation or in your family, each child needs to take turns practicing talking and they need multiple turn, turns, sorry. Okay, so when we think about using play-based interactions and this could be with teacher scaffolding or with at home when you are playing with your children at home. So we need to think that when we have the opportunity in play to support children's language development, that is going to be key and it's going to be hold children's attention and they're gonna retain that vocabulary because it's part of their play. So we should also think about those opportunities to develop children's language as they direct their own play activities. Um, Lynn, I think we're gonna skip this video, is that correct? And go straight to questions. Are there any questions? And feel free to unmute if you'd like to ask a question or you're welcome to put it in the chat, whichever you're more comfortable with. And I don't know if we lost Lynn or. No, she, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, if there are no questions, then it looks as though we're going to finish up a couple of minutes early earlier than planned. But before you go, I would like to share the final screen. This is our contact information. Um, Wendy Burgess is the team lead for early learning. And you'll see her uh, email address. You'll see Angela's email address as well as my own. Please feel free to contact us for any of your needs or support. Uh, we're available. And we look forward to hearing from each of you as you may need us. I'm going to turn it over to um, our moderator now and see if anyone, she has anything, last words to say. Um, thank you so much, both to Lynn and to Angela, for your thoughtful presentation and for engaging and giving those opportunities. Um, for those of you who don't have any questions, you are welcome to go ahead and, um, you know, take a little bit of a stretch break. Our next session will start promptly at 11 a.m. You should have the schedule as well as the link of where to join that session. Um, but at 1050, just so you're aware, if you hang out a little longer, the room will close to save time to record and finish finalizing the recording of this presentation. Those will be made available to all attendees. Um, so thank you for your time and your attention. And if there are no other questions, y'all have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you. And Angela and I will stay on for another minute or two. And thank you so much. We appreciate your participation. Yes. Thank you, Angela.